I try and make the contribution that is within my power to make and hope to do it conscientiously and well. And on a good day, maybe I leave the planet better than I found it. Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you are ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. My guest today coined the term first-hand food. You know, food that you grow, you cultivate, you forage for, you fish, or you hunt for. Food that you get yourself. Her name is Tamar Haspel. She writes the James Beard Award-winning Washington Post column, Unearthed, which covers the intersection of food and science, exploring how what we eat affects us and our planet. She's also written for Discover, Vox, Slate, Fortune, Eater, Edible Cape Cod, and other magazines and publications. She's also co-host of the podcast, Climavores, which takes a good, hard, entertaining look at food's impact on climate and the environment. Her latest book, the one in which I ask her many questions in this conversation is called To Boldly Grow, Finding Joy, Adventure, and Dinner in Your Own Backyard. The book is structured and our interview loosely follows the structure of gardening, chickens, fishing, foraging, turkeys, hunting. And we explore these topics and many others, including the ethics of eating animals. Again, we go deeper into firsthand food, what exactly it is and why it matters, why it could matter to you. And we talk also about relationships. It's a theme that comes up again and again. And I think Tamar's take on what it takes to create and sustain a lasting and fulfilling relationship is actually pretty cool. So you can hear about all that in this interview. You can learn more about Tamar on the web at tamarhospital.com. It's H-A-S-P-E-L and Tamar is T-A-M-A-R. Just like it sounds, you can find her on Twitter. Of course, you can read her column on the Washington Post or listen to her podcast. With that, I hope that this interview gives you some practical ideas and some inspiration to live a healthier, happier, life that's a little closer to nature than maybe it was yesterday. Please enjoy this conversation with my friend, Tamar Hospital. Tamar, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you for having me, Brilliant. It's, it's my pleasure. Will you tell me, please, what is life about? You know, I think life is what you make of it. I think life's meaning is that with which we imbue it with our words and deeds. And uh, so everybody's life is different. And for me, I try and make the contribution that is within my power to make and hope to do it conscientiously and well. And on a good day, maybe I leave the planet better than I found it. Yeah, it seems to me my view, and I don't know, this is the first time we've talked, I've read your book. Uh, and which I love, by the way, we'll talk plenty about that. But um, from what it seems to me, you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> for what it's well, I, I hope so. But, you know, we I, I don't know that we ever really know because, yeah. you know, we don't get a representative sample of the feedback. And yeah, I, I hear some good things from people pretty regularly. But of course, there's lots you don't hear. And if I make people angry or put them on the wrong path, uh, that may not be something I know. But yeah. You do your best and you hope for the best. That's right. And even if we do have any kind of confirmation, either way, there's still the matter of history <laughs> that, you know, I, I think a lot about, I think it was Steinbeck who died feeling that he was a failure. And I just reflect, you know, now depends how you measure, right? It always so, depends on how you measure. Yeah. So let me start here. Um, let me ask you about, I understand at one point, maybe still, you have a car. It's a manual transmission. It got stuck in first gear. <laughs> it was a pretty simple fix once you figured it out, but uh, that's maybe representative or a good jumping off point. Will you tell me about that car and what happened? Yeah, I will. It's it's very ordinary car. It's a Volkswagen Jetta. 
And I like a manual transmission. And if we had more than the hour and a half, I would tell you how I ended up with that car rather than the other car, which was the one that my husband kind of wanted to have. And uh, and one day I get into the car and it's locked in first gear. I left it in first gear and I couldn't get it out. And I had no idea what to make of this. And I live in a small community on Cape Cod. And it just so happens that there's an auto mechanic who we have used before called Moore Automotive that is just a mile down the road, a mile and a half, something like that. And if you have a manual transmission car stuck in first gear, you can drive it. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And and Kevin, my husband, followed me in, in the truck, which was working perfectly well. And we went to Moore Automotive and I pulled the car in and I went in and I and I said to them and they're very nice. And I said, I've got this problem. My car is stuck in first gear. And she said, oh, we're really busy today, but I think we can we can, you know, at least take a look at it. Ah, thank you very much. So this kid and I can call him a kid because I'm definitely old enough to be his mother and plausibly old enough to be his grandmother. And he comes over and he opens the hood and I see that there are oyster shells all over the engine of the car. And you would have thought that I would have had the foresight to open the trunk before I took it to more automotive, but I didn't. So kid opens the trunk and there's all of these oyster shells and we have an oyster shell driveway, but it's not the kind of oyster shell that you might think of because when you buy oyster shell, it's all cleaned and it's nice and there's no little bits of oyster left in it. But we have an oyster farm and we associate with other people who have oyster farms and our oyster shells are the ones that are, you know, the throwaways, um, the dead shell from the actual farm and it hasn't been cleaned and there are like little bits of creatures in it. And, you know, whenever we get a delivery, we have the smelliest driveway in town. And it turned out that the rats were taking these oyster shells that had little bits of things attached to them and enjoying them in the privacy of my car. Wow. And they were of course not cleaning up after themselves and and the more automotive kid reaches his arm, he's got a long arm, he reaches it way in. And it turned out that there was an oyster shell in the linkage of the gear shift. And that was what was <laughs> preventing the car from getting out of first gear. He pulled it out. The car worked like a dream and they didn't even charge me. I, I will say that I tipped ridiculously for this <laughs> service, but, and it, it, it turned out to be, one of the joys of living in a small community. And, you know, I come from New York City and things w w were different there. And and since I've been in, in this community, I've had a lot of experiences like that. And that's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that. It's just, it's so, it's so random. You know, it I is live random. <laughs> one person in this nation of 330 million people that has that happen, you know, each, there's probably not even one each day. <laughs> probably but, not. That seems pretty, I mean, in, you have many incredible life experiences. I only know of a few because you've written a book, which we can see in the frame behind you for anyone watching this, um, to boldly grow. You share so many things that I just, part of what I loved about the book, because I learned a lot. I learned about lobstering. I learned about mushrooms the, and, and I learned about building a um, an earth oven, like all these kinds of things, roadkill, a little bit about roadkill, roadkill, but let me ask you why I, obviously you've written at the intersection of food and science for a long time. So you have a, a large volume of work and incredible life experience, but why, why this book? Why now? And who's it for? And what do you want it to do for the, for that reader? It's such a great question because in some ways, this book is about some of the things that are the polar opposite of the things that I write about. I write about, as you say, where, where food meets science. I write about agriculture. I write about nutrition. I kind of have a reputation of being a hard-assed empiricist. I spend all my time on PubMed trying to understand, you know, the science of the things that I report on. And then in my spare time... <laughs> I get dirty. And when my husband and I left New York City and we came to Cape Cod, um, you know, we looked around and said, 
okay, well, what can we do on Cape Cod that we couldn't do in New York? And the answer was all kinds of things, because all of a sudden we live on this little house and two acres on a lake. And we had, and since I wrote about food, I wanted to do food related things. And the origin of the book was that I said to Kevin one day, as we're looking at gardening, thinking about building a chicken coop, learning how to go clamming, I said, Kevin, do you think that we can go a whole year and eat one food a day that we get firsthand, that we grow or raise or hunt or fish or gather? And Kevin, who is wildly supportive of my enterprises and has a never fail, can do attitude, goes, not a chance. <laughs> I'm like, wait, who who are you? And what have you done with Kevin? And I did talk him into it. But the reason I ended up writing the book, and it started off as a project that I wanted to write about. And it was it was more than a lark, but not a lot more. But it, it turned out to be compelling for a lot of visceral reasons, emotional reasons, personal reasons that are almost the opposite of the things that I write about in my column and in my work. And I wanted to write the book because the whole enterprise took me by surprise. And I thought maybe I could convey that to other people. And it, it sort of made me wildly enthusiastic about taking a, a risk in middle age, doing something completely different from what you did before. And yeah, you end up learning a lot about the thing, but you also end up learning a lot about you. And, and I feel like I came out the other end different. And, and I wanted to write about that. Wow. Do you find that, um, it seems to me that this is like, just a perfect timing, right? Because you started this project before the pandemic. Oh, I started the project in 2009. It was a million yeah, years so ago. Way before. And, and <laughs> one of the things that I see, and you probably see this more than me, because I would imagine the interaction with your readers and your other research and so forth, is that it seems to be a dream. You know, many people dream of starting a business. Many people dream of writing a screenplay. Many people dream of owning a professional sports franchise or even an airline, which I don't know why, <laughs> but there's, it seems to be growing in my estimation that there's a dream to have a little homestead, to return to the land, to eat the things we grew with our own, you know, our, and we watched it grow with our own eyes. But how have you seen this um, just as part of, do you see that too, that there's a dream that people have their own chickens and maybe their own pigs and things like this, that's even growing more and more? I think there is that, and people do have that dream, and I've heard that from a lot of people, but it wasn't my dream. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was, it was one of the things that was weird about it when we started it, because I started doing this project, and, you know, I had a little blog about it, and people would assume that it was my dream, that this was, that we were looking for some kind of lifestyle, that we were looking for self-sufficiency. And often this kind of enterprise goes with some kind of ideology, whether it's opting out of the industrialized food system or, you know, creating a bulwark against Armageddon. There are a number of reasons that people do this. But, and people would ask me why I'm doing it. And I, I didn't have a good answer. I would say, well, <laughs> seems like a constructive use of my time. <laughs> Yeah. keeps me doing different things. It's interesting. And I found that I not having a good answer for that left me sort of, okay, scratching my head, you know, am I missing out on something here? And it was only after I had done it for a good, I don't know, eight years that I realized it had changed me fundamentally. And so it, it was, it snuck up on me and because it, it wasn't the thing I was aiming for. I, it wasn't, a, it was never been a lifestyle for us. We were never in it for self-sufficiency. We are staunch interdependentists, you know? <laughs> yeah. we, we love the idea that we're connected to, to other people and, and our community. And this project actually ended up being the opposite of self-sufficiency. It did connect us to our community. And, and I think that in a time of, I don't know if you've ever read the book Bowling Alone, about how we tend to be walled off from our communities, especially when we're absorbed with our phones. Something yeah. that 
that gives you tendrils into your community to meet people you wouldn't have met otherwise, I think is very satisfying and very interesting and kind of good for all of us. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. And this, um, I don't want to say a theme, but this this reality that it changed you. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some of the ways that you think it changed you and, and in your estimation, are they all for the better? (laughs) That's such an interesting question because I think the fundamental thing that it did for me, and, you know, I, I described this in the book, I started off as, you know, having a real affinity for my armchair and, and it's not a bad thing in a writer because I was interviewing people. I was researching things. I was writing about stuff, all of which could be done conveniently from my armchair. And, uh, you know, but I married a doer and because even though I, spent a lot of armchair time, I've always been curious and engaged in the world around me. And so it it didn't take that much to convince me to go out and try some things, do some things, get my hands dirty. And, you know, along the way, the surprise was that it it turned out to be sort of the key to successful self-improvement. There are a few things that I have worked on all my life to get better at, you know, writing, diplomacy, which has never been my my strong suit, pie crust. There, there's some things that I just chip away at, but the, the you never get the improvement increment as you do from going from never having done something to having done it for the first time. That's yeah. where the action is. That's the steep part of the learning curve. And doing this project, trying project after project after project, we, you know, we built the gardens and then we built the raised beds and then we built the chicken coops and then we got turkeys and we had to house them and we had to learn to slaughter them and we made our own sea salt and we learned about mushrooms and, you know, we learned how to fish and, and all these other things. And it was so many of them were that increment going from never having done it to the first time. And so I feel like I've spent the last decade plus on that steep part of the learning curve. And, and it's been, it's been, it, it's been, I mean, exciting is maybe a word I couldn't back up because it's not like there's some things in the world that are truly exciting and, and maybe, you know, finding a mushroom isn't it. But but it is in a way. And 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 so that's been great Um, as far as things changing, not for the better. I think, you know, you always lose lose something when you change and it would be hard for me to put my finger on it. But I I couldn't go back, I don't think, to the way life was before. And I probably lose something there, but it's not something that I spend a lot of time thinking about because I'm so pleased (laughs) with the changes for the better. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. That's great. Everyone should be so lucky. But, um, you know, this idea, uh, it's a term that I hadn't heard before. If I'd heard it, I wasn't aware that I'd heard it. Uh, Firsthand food. And you've already, you've, you've mentioned it already in our conversation here. But I just want to, I want to explore that with you a little bit, because I think for people listening, just to have a name for something, to have a term for something, and especially as we're becoming even more aware and concerned about, I think, um, things like climate change, Mm -hmm. we start to realize that how far our food has to travel has a real impact on the carbon footprint of us as an individual Mm -hmm. on this planet and so forth, that there's a lot of merit in this idea for a lot of different reasons, many of which you've already, I think, touched on. But what what is firsthand food and why is it something that maybe we should care more about? So you never heard of it because I had to make it up. And okay. but, and I was like sort of mystified that I had to make it up. So let me ask you, do you grow any of your own food? Have you? Not really. We, we've, have you- we've tried a few things, but we have deer and we're not real active in keeping them out. So they've eaten <laughs> our strawberries and they don't eat the jalapenos. I know that, so, but not really. <laughs> fishing, foraging, anything like that? No. Okay. So if there were something that you did, here's the question I would ask you because it's the question I ask everybody who does anything like that. The question is, does that food feel different to you? The food that you're invested in, the food that you got dirty in service of. Um, 
And I have never had anyone tell me no. And what's interesting about it, at least to me, is that I can ask, uh, you know, crunchy granola left-leaning gardener this question, and I can ask a rock ribbed Republican deer hunter this question, and they have the same answer. This food is different because I am invested in it. This is something I got with my own two hands and I put it on the table for my family and my friends. And, you know, I don't want to go full blown kumbaya on you, but it seems like this is something that unites us. This is something that humans have in common. And it, it scratches this primordial itch we have to feed ourselves. Yet there was no name for the category of things that you get with your own two hands. So Kevin and I started calling it firsthand food and there you go. And, and because what's important about it isn't whether it's, excuse me, a, a mushroom or a tomato or a fish or a deer. What's important of, about it is its firsthandedness. And that's yeah. what makes it different yet the category didn't have a name. And so I invented it. Right on. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really happy to know that. So the structure of the book goes gardening, chickens, fishing, foraging, turkeys, hunting. It seemed to me that that was a pretty linear and logical progression, but did it really, did, did, is that the case? Did you kind of investigate something, begin doing it, achieve maybe some level of mastery. And then I don't know if you got bored with it, but you went, what else is there? And then you just kept, was that, was that? Um, there um, was a lot of that. I mean, there was a huge amount of overlap, but yeah, <laughs> that's basically where we started. We started with gardening because that was, well, that's the easy thing. That's sort of the low hanging fruit. And that's what, the, you know, the normal thing that everybody does. And so we did that. And then we're like, okay, well, what's the next thing? What's a, what's a slightly harder thing. And, and, you know, backyard chickens. Okay. We've never designed a chicken coop, but people have been keeping chickens for literally thousands of years. How hard can it be? And, you know, so, you know, we, we don't have like the past down knowledge that anyone who lived a couple hundred years ago would have had because everybody kept chickens and any six-year-old would know how to take care of chickens and although but although we didn't have that we did have youtube <laughs> and, and there's a lot of stuff out there that you can learn about chickens and so then we did that and um and from there we thought about keeping other livestock and to get over the hurdle where you do have to slaughter them. And that was something that was very difficult for me. And, and, and I know I sound sort of breezy about a lot of this stuff, but we take that very seriously. And I, and I hope that comes through in the book as well. Um, so yeah, it, it did happen basically in that order. Hmm. I was a little surprised to see that bees weren't in there. Oh, we did bees. <laughs> I would, um, would maybe even have its own. And I, thing, I but... think I might have mentioned it once or twice, but um, but yeah, we did bees for probably six or seven years, but it was nothing but heartbreak. And because we lost the colonies every spring, we probably harvested honey twice in that time. And wow. bees are fascinating. And I would love to be able to have bees successfully, but it just broke my heart every year. And I mean, we took heroic measures. Are you a beekeeper? No, although we have some property where we're planning this year to be. Oh, you should do bees. Brilliant. They're, they're, they're so interesting and you learn so much. And it's also another thing where, you know, where I live and, and in a lot of places and hopefully where you live too, there's a beekeeping community and you can, like we took the local bee school and, wow. and we, we met the people who are sort of the mentors for the people who are, are learning to keep bees. And it, it, is, it is a wonderful and satisfying thing, but either because of where we are, I don't think it was because of our mad lack of skills, <laughs> because we tried really hard. And, and, uh, and this is a common theme on Cape Cod that people have trouble with bees. Um, and it just didn't work out for us. It was really sad. Wow. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Where's a place uh, that you recommend if people, you know, like people listening to this, um, begin with their own firsthand food 
And maybe I think your example was an old oak barrel in Manhattan. Yeah, it was. And so this is the thing. The thing about firsthand food is that there's something for everybody. So you have to let it meet you where you are and you don't have to go all in. I mean, we went all in, but, you know, we had enough time and 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 enough focus to be able to do that. Our kids are grown. You know, we had the land. We could do some of these things. Um But when we started it, we lived in Manhattan. We lived in a condo on the Upper West Side. And we started by putting whiskey barrels on our roof. And, you know, people who live in cities, there are options with like those. Have you ever seen those mushroom kits that you you buy them and the spores in them and then you water them and then the mushrooms grow out the sides? They're crazy. They're really great. Get a Chia Pet. I start with one of those window box hydroponic things on the windowsill and and see if it speaks to you if you live outside the city um there are often mushroom walks with the local the local mycological societies um plant a tomato in a pot uh and then if if it speaks to you then go our route and try a chicken coop um there's there's something for every budget for every schedule and of course like Think about food that you like to eat because that matters too. That's where a lot of the joy in food comes from. So yeah, it totally depends on where you are, what your constraints are, and what you like to eat. Mm. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Let's see. I'm just looking. I I really like this description. Firsthand food. So this is something you've written in the book. Firsthand food is an exercise in selectively reintroducing the hardships of our choosing. Only please call it recreation. <laughs> and it is way more fun when you don't have to do it. It so, is. But it and really, in some ways, it's a, a privilege, such a privilege. Uh, it's absolutely a privilege. And this is, this, it sort of gets to this idea of what the modern food system has done for us and what it's cost us. Because I am not in favor of turning back the clock and going back to subsistence agriculture. I, my Kevin and I have an oyster farm. I've done a lot of farm work in my day, and it is backbreaking labor. You know, oysters are one of the least mechanizable foods out there, and farming oysters is like farming rocks. You just have to move heavy stuff from place to place in the water, often in the cold, and it. I mean, we chose to do it because, I mean, it was a first world choice. We could do it. And one of the reasons we did it is that it helps keep us fit. Um, But people who have no choices, this is a crappy choice, having to raise all your own food. It's not something that anyone should be forced to do. And uh, our modern industrialized food system has moved most people in, in the developed world off the land if they choose to go off the land. But of course it's had consequences because it, in doing that, it has really removed us from the source of our food. And I think our very sense of what food is has gravitated away from, from plants and animals and toward you know boxes and bags and you know yeah. the bright colors and the exciting punctuation and all that stuff. And it's been to our detriment in a lot of ways. And, you know, in the United States, we have the obesity problem and the diabetes problem and the heart disease that is attendant with having a diet that has moved far away from the plants and animals that are the foods that humans thrive on. And you have all these people, including me, in the media saying, oh, just eat real food. Okay, well, great. But how do you do that when every day you go out and the boxes and the bags are in your face 24 seven and they're cheap and they're convenient and they're deliberately engineered to be irresistibly delicious? And how can we possibly fight that? But when you go out and and you get dirty, you put your phone down, you roll up your sleeves, you 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 weed the garden or you feed the chickens, it connects you to those plants and animals in a visceral way. And again, this is like the opposite of science. And I think it's that visceral thing that has the power to move the needle back the other way and and think about food, or feel about food differently. Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, I think you're maybe closer, you're more of a scientist than I think of myself as, but I would add to this. I know it's 
maybe not a lot of hard evidence for this, but I would add that I think there's a lot of our um, mental health is compromised Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Not only because we're not nourishing ourselves, but also because we're disconnected from nature and the source of life perhaps, and what it takes for us to even eat a meal, you know? And I think that has consequences in some pretty, and you know, people yeah. have done these these studies about what happens when you spend time outdoors, and it all seems to be good, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and right. so it, there's really no downside. Um, and you know, you can talk about what kind of evidence supports the upside, um, but there's no real disadvantage. Yeah, that that's right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about. Um, Oh man, I've got a few, I've got a few other questions. One with uh, foraging. I thought this was really cool. I, I, I almost didn't believe it was a real thing. And then you go on to explain it. The universal edibility test. <laughs> what is that? So yeah, the mushrooms are like people really balk. And I, I really, I get why the upside is a nice soup and the downside is an excruciating death. I, I get why people shy away from that. Um, and there is such a thing as a universal edibility test. And it, it involves eating very, very small amounts, like first just tasting something and, you know, just a tiny bit and waiting to see if anything bad happens and then eating a little bit and waiting to see if anything bad happens. Um, and, and I, I yeah, it works, but it takes like 17 years. So you kind of need to accelerate the process. And with mushrooms, so there's basically, I'd say three categories of things that you forage for. There's fungi, there's green plants, and then vegetables, and then there's fruits. And I tackle each of those differently. So mushrooms, there's a category of mushrooms with that all the deadly ones are in. They're these slender gilled mushrooms and you have to know what you're doing to eat those. And I just don't eat any of those. I only go for the, there's groups of mushrooms that don't have deadly ones in them. And so if you taste a little bit of it, nothing's going to happen, but you're going to find out if it tastes good. And so I am not afraid to taste a wild mushroom as long as it's not this slender gilled mushroom. And I think that that people can feel a little more comfortable going out in the mushroom world if they have just those few basic guidelines. But so then there's green vegetable things. And it's really unlikely that there is a green vegetable thing that tastes good enough that you're going to want to eat it and is poisonous so that it's going to do you harm because the poisons in green vegetables taste terrible. (laughs) And so I have nibbled so many leaves, I can't even tell you. And most wild leaves are really no good because they have to fight off their own insects. We have these milk toast plants in our garden like basil and, you know, they, they don't have like chemical defenses or these hairy things or woody stems because they don't we're there to protect them but the wild plants have to fend for themselves and so they all taste terrible fruits are a different category i don't eat those unless i know what they are yeah there's something about this that it for me um and i i don't want this to sound wrong but i part of what i love about this is how childlike it is there's a curiosity it really is there's (laughs) there's a willingness to experiment and this is when you say like you've nibbled so many of these plants. And I think in the book, you say that over the years, you've really only found two that were not mushrooms, but the green plants that you thought were even worth trying, but that yeah. seems like a pretty low ratio. It's a terribly low ratio. And, <laughs> and I, I don't forage much for green stuff. It's just not worth it. And yeah, there's dandelion greens in the spring and there's uh, we have a lot of day lilies in this part of the world and day lily shoots are actually good but also the the one thing i'll say the exception to that is is the allium family is onions so chives and wild onions those are awesome and and you can find some very of them all the time but you, you you're so right about the childlike thing and this was one of the things that happened when we when i first started doing the chickens and you know you you get these little chicks and they're really cute and you put pictures on your social media feed and and 
I, I was in my mid forties or something when we started this. And how many things give you this sort of childlike sense of wonder once you're at this, this age? I mean, it has to be something you haven't encountered before. It has to be something that's relatively simple. I mean, you don't get it from Wordle. And, <laughs> and so it, it, this is a great vehicle to sort of relive that really childlike sense of wonder at things in the world. And, and, and I, I, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. And even then beyond what it, what comes from that, again, the gratitude that it, these things even exist, that mm -hmm. they're edible, you know, the interrelatedness of, and everything that had happened in the universe. I, again, I can get pretty philosophical pretty quick, but it's amazing that we're here on the planet <laughs> with this temperature, with this water content. And, you know, this is pretty remarkable. Let me ask you, uh, let me ask you a few questions about, about Kevin. You've mentioned your husband a few times. He's a, He's a prominent character <laughs> in this book. And in particular, I want to ask you about something that you say, uh, you talk about a term. I love this term, non-overlapping magisteria. And you say one of the, it's one of the bedrock principles of a successful marriage. Will you tell us what that is and why you say that? So, yeah. Um, so the late evolutionary biologist, Stephen Jay Gould wrote an essay many years ago about reconciling science and religion. And he basically made the case that science and religion don't have to be reconciled because they rule completely different spheres, non-overlapping magisteria. And I, and I think that that can apply in a marriage. I think that, you know, there are lots of problems that benefit from having the best input of both Kevin and me, but sometimes it's better if you just butt out and let the other person do their thing their way. And Kevin and I happen to have wildly different ideas about how things ought to be done. If there are 10 ways to do something and you ask Kevin his top five and me my top five, there will be no overlap. So we're wow. constantly approaching things from our just our brains are wired in completely different ways, which can be fascinating and can also result in some very creative solutions, but it can also be irritating. And so, so there are things that are his department, and it's not like we have a formal agreement about this, and, and there, but there are things that are my department, and I do my things my way, and he does his things his way, and then we collaborate on some other things. And, and I think everybody needs some autonomy now and then, and, uh, and so, so it, 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 it really, it works for us. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, with that, I think you told a story that was illustrative of this, of uh, it had to do with the mailbox. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. So this, so I, I've already mentioned how different Kevin and my temperaments are and are the way we approach things. And the story that I used to illustrate this in the book was, it's actually not about me. It's about my mother, who's a lot like me and, or I guess I should say I'm a lot like her. And we grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, in a just, you know ordinary suburban raised ranch on a third of an acre. We had a driveway and a mailbox. And uh, for reasons that I, I still have a hard time wrapping my mind around, we were considered the neighborhood weirdos. And I, I didn't think we were that weird, but, but other people did. And so we were the, the, the targets of occasional sort of low level neighborhood vandalism and the the top part of our mailbox got loose and you could take it right off the stake and occasionally it would disappear and you know we'd find it when my mother was walking the dog or something and then the whole thing you could just pick the stake in the mailbox out of its hole and and one day the whole mailbox disappeared and it reappeared a day later but my mom was getting sick and tired of this <coughs> excuse me and so if Kevin had been on the scene, we would have poured a concrete anchorage. We would have put the mailbox in, in such a way that, you know, come Armageddon, it's the last mailbox standing. But Kevin wasn't there. And my mother's solution was to take the mailbox in with the mail. 
So every morning we would put the mailbox out. And then after the mailman came, we would take the mail in with the mailbox. We'd put the mailbox in the garage. We'd bring the mail upstairs. And the, the, the system actually worked pretty well, except you know, every now and then we'd be late. And the mailman would be coming and we'd have to run down to the garage, grab the mailbox and run out and hold it out to the mailman so he could put the mail in there. Um, and eventually we did get a mailbox. But this is my temperament. I am makeshift to the core, whereas Kevin wants to solve problems for all time. And so when we decided to build a chicken coop, you know. I think uh, we literally had a refrigerator box in the garage. I'm like, hey, that could be a chicken coop. And Kevin's like, you know, thinking of steel framing, you know. <laughs> and so and so we invoked the principle of non-overlapping magisteria because I knew that Kevin was more qualified to do this because he had actually built things before. And also, you know, a chicken coop has to protect chickens and his temperament was probably the better one to go for that. And so we did actually end up doing mostly Kevin. And so not overlapping magisteria is about butting out and I'm not always the best butter outer. <laughs> and I did violate his magisterium a couple of times and I did trespass, but it was okay. And we worked through it and, uh, and we have a beautiful chicken coop still standing out there. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And I would imagine this uh, works even better when it, you, when a couple does what it seems you do, which is also to, to give each other this space. I mean, sometimes we'll kind of, like you said, you know, maybe butt in somewhere that's somebody else's thing, but when, uh, when we make space and that just reminds me, a teacher of mine once suggested that love is granting another the space to be all the ways they are and all the ways they are not. And it seems like maybe that's what, maybe that's part of making this work. I do think so. And I have been profoundly grateful for my husband because um, he understands exactly what my strengths and weaknesses are. And he loves me not so much in spite of my weaknesses, but in some ways because of them. Uh -huh. um, and, and we both understand that I, I think a good 80% of making a marriage work is kindness and ordinary courtesy. And we try and invoke those at all times. Oh, I think you're right. Let me ask you about your podcast. So I understand ah. a long ago, you've launched a podcast, Climavores. Is that Climavores, right? Climavores, yes. And it's it's almost, it's sort of the opposite of To Boldly Grow because it is this wonky podcast about um, the climate impact that our food has. And uh, I'm co-hosting with another wonky journalist named Mike Grunewald. And he comes at it from sort of the, the, the climate and the policy end. And I come at it from the food end. And we agree about some things and we disagree about other things. And we've just started recording. So we're going to have a few episodes um, out when we launch on June 21st. And I hope it's going to be interesting. And I hope it's going to be entertaining. And I hope people uh, tune in and ask us questions and, and we'll see. I, this is my first foray into podcasting. What's it like having a podcast? Brilliant. I love it. It's, I've, it's been four years for me now. And wow. I thought about it for a long time. My first episode released uh, May 8th of 2018. Wow. And I actually got into podcasting because I, I started a coaching company, you know, to help people mm -hmm. live healthier, happier lives. And then I realized I didn't have what I didn't have a very effective way to market it. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I, I don't really like marketing. <laughs> so I thought, what could I do that will kind of check the box of me personally continuing to learn and grow, enjoy myself, make new friends. And then perhaps I could take that and chop it up in some ways. Maybe it would be blog posts. Maybe it would be tweets. You know, maybe it would be YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And then that could be a form of marketing. And that was the idea. So then I came up with the structure and I basically have continued on because I love to read and mm -hmm. I love people and I hope to contribute to others. And then I've set aside the marketing <laughs> almost entirely. And now almost, uh, you know, four years later, I've interviewed almost 200 authors. Wow. And I love it. I'm, I'm in a lot of ways. I feel like I am having a second childhood and this is part of it. It's so, great. I love it. 
And, you know, one of the best parts of my job as a journalist is that I get to call people up and ask them to tell me about their work. And it's oh. it's fascinating. And, and I feel like I'm really lucky to be in that position. So I definitely share your sense that talking to different people about different stuff all the time is a really interesting way to live your life. Yeah. It, I mean, one of the things that I love is someone can spend many people do three, four, five decades learning something. And I can buy their book for 15 bucks and read it in eight hours. And then especially if they're willing to talk with me, it's just such a privilege to read and I'll make notes, you know, in my Kindle, I typically mm -hmm, read in Kindle. Mm -hmm. I want to know more about that. And then to be able to share that. And I, I used to have a book club and mm -hmm. I actually abandoned the book club because my reading is now focused on my guests' books. Mm -hmm. And then I divide my reading into deceased <laughs> and living <laughs> author. So I've only recently, um, I've committed to read 10 pages each day of someone. It's either not going to be a guest or is deceased to try to capture all that. But I love it. I hope you, I hope you enjoy your podcasting experience half as much as I enjoy mine or four times as much. It's, I think it's wonderful. Good. I, that's good to hear. Cause so far we've really enjoyed it. And, you know, it's been a lot of um, preparation. We're working with a production company that is wonderful and, and helping us sort of get our bearings in this and, uh, and we'll see it's, it's exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So we've covered a lot. We didn't talk about animals too much. Uh, people are you uncomfortable could, with animals. I know. You said you could clean a squid in 20 seconds? At the peak uh, yeah. Of, I, uh, yes. At the peak of my prowess, I can clean a squid in 20 seconds. It, it's funny because we just did squid season and I couldn't get it down. That I, I only did as well as 30. But, wow. um, but when you start with squid, it's... Uh, it's like, oh, how do I do this again? And then eventually, oh yeah, this is how it goes. And then you you just get better at it. But that's how skills work. That's how physical skills work. So something I do, I was really curious to ask you more about is you talk about the difference between self-sufficient, I think it's self-sufficiency and self-reliance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always thought of those as basically the same thing, but I don't think you see it that way. How do you see it? I think I kind of did too. And, and then I started thinking about it harder and, and it made sense to me that they were different because I do think that self-sufficiency is imply, it does sort of imply walling yourself off to some extent from your fellow man. And you are going to, to, um, to complete, to support yourself in this way that is sufficient. Whereas being self-reliant is able to solve problems that come up. And, and to me, it has a slightly different feel. And, you know, I'm sure I'm, there are other pe people would disagree with that. And it means different things to different people. And I guess I sort of used those two words to try and describe how I felt about what I had learned. That I, you know, I... I wasn't trying to wall us off from society and, you know, build that bulwark against Armageddon or anything like that. Um, I just wanted to learn to rely on myself to solve problems, to do things that maybe I thought I couldn't do, like mm -hmm. kill animals. So, yeah. <laughs> and are, are you a vegan, Billion? I'm not vegan, but I am vegetarian and I have been for more than 10 years. I do mm -hmm. eat eggs and mm -hmm. I do eat dairy, but I don't eat the way I said, I don't eat anything with a face. Mm -hmm. No, I understand that. And I, I am respectful of a principled position and I obviously do eat meat. And it's, it's actually been interesting because one of the things that surprised me when we did go into that, you know, livestock and, and, and slaughtering our, our turkeys, there were people who were vegetarian or even vegan who wanted to participate because one of the reasons that vegans become vegans is because they do want to opt out of an industrialized food system that does not treat animals well. Um, but they were willing to consider eating an animal that had been well raised and slaughtered as humanely as, as we can do it. Um, and so it, it was actually interesting doing that and having those conversations. Uh, I can, <clears throat> I can imagine. 
I can just see that this makes you very uncomfortable. <laughs> it does. I, I woke up on, I woke up on Wednesday and I got on the elliptical and I started reading and I got to the part where you were, uh, you had just raised turkeys. I think you'd had them. They grow so much in like four or five months, five months. Yeah. And then, um, and then you, and then you slaughter them. And, uh, as you dis- you discuss, um, your, you know, your thoughts, your feelings about it, which I appreciate. Uh, but just the description. And I think if I had to, if I had to do that, um, I'd have a new, like a new appreciation or new sensitivity. And I get as humans on this planet for a long time, we've been eating meat and so forth. Um, but yeah, and I have brothers who are hunters. Mm -hmm. And when I read what you wrote about hunting, I actually really appreciated your sense about if you have to, I think you said something like, if you have to kill an animal to, to have a successful hunt, you're not a hunter, you're a killer. Right. Like, People say that all the time. And, but, but uh, yes. And for me, um, I'm not really much of a hunter. I'm more of a harvester. So I have been able to take deer because I have a friend who lives in a place that's overrun with deer and you don't have to be skilled in any way. Um, and the reason I do it is because I think if you're going to eat meat, taking an overpopulated ruminant that's doing damage to an ecosystem is the most responsible way to do it. Um, And, but I know hunters who are much more attuned to the woods and who get satisfaction from those other parts of hunting that don't really speak to me so much. Yeah. Um, so I think the last, the last question I have for now, and I'm sure I'll think of two or three more as we transition, but uh, so two last questions. One was about acorns. And I, this was another thing I love about the book is how it, I can imagine that, you know, embarking on this firsthand food journey really does have the potential to change the way you see the entire world. And, and everything's just, food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything's food. And now you can't look at an acorn without thinking something should eat that or someone or something should eat that. What, tell me about your, your experience with acorns. So, you know, I know that acorns are nuts and I know that nuts are food, but it took me a long time to connect the dots that acorns could be food. And of course, acorns have been food for indigenous people here um, since there were indigenous people. Um, They're a very nutritious, high calorie source of food, but they're very tannic and bitter. And in order to be palatable, they have to be rinsed and rinsed and rinsed and rinsed and rinsed. You sort of leach the tannins um, and and those bitter compounds out of them. And at first that was pretty daunting to me because it seemed like a lot of work for something that people really weren't that enthusiastic about as food. And this is true of a lot of foraged food that it's, it's not that tasty. And, you know, there's a reason, you know, we eat almonds and not acorns. But then I figured out, okay, well, if you have to, like, just soak them in water and keep changing the water, we all have an appliance in our house that does that for us. And so I put them in a mesh bag and I put them in the toilet tank because every time you flush the toilet, the water changes. And everybody's like, tomorrow, you can't do that. You can't do that. I'm like, of course I can. Because, like... All of the icky stuff in toilets happens downstream of the toilet tank. The water that comes into your toilet tank is the same water that you shower with. And so, so there the acorns were. They stayed there for like a week or so, and they came out, and they were extremely leached of their, of their bitter components. But they still weren't all that great. We made these flatbreads out of them, and they were okay. And if I needed to feed myself and my family, you bet I would do it. Um, but I do have the luxury of being able to get pecans. <laughs> and so, you know, acorns are out of the loop. <laughs> yeah. And I understand they make pretty good feed for pigs. Oh, the pigs love them. And uh, there's not a lot about the pigs in the book, because I think that of all our firsthand food ventures, pigs are probably the one that people are least likely to to embark on. But backyard pigs are awesome. Pigs are are smart and charismatic and interesting. And and then, of course, everybody is upset because you do kill them. That's the reason. The only reason we have pigs is that we eat pigs. Otherwise, there wouldn't be anything resembling a domestic pig. Oh. Um, 
And yeah, and I, I, I do talk about that in the book and, and how seriously I take that job of, of killing animals and under what circumstances um, I will eat an animal and, and what circumstances I won't. And, you know, I, th- I think human existence is inherently an animal killing proposition. We kill them when we take their habitat to build our homes. We kill them with our cars. We kill them with our chemicals. We kill them with our machinery. And if we're going to say it's immoral to kill animals for human survival, then humans don't survive. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, I think, and the question I ask myself is how can I minimize animal suffering um, and that can include livestock. Um, it depends, I think, on how you raise it and how you kill it. Yeah. I know I keep oh. coming back to that and you hate it every time. <laughs> I stop well, that. I, That's the last I, thing I I'll say for, about killing animals. Oh, I, I forgot that the point you made in the book about, you're right, that even, you know, vegetarian um, agriculture still has an, you know, whether you in insects and pesticides and loss of habitat and these kinds of things that there's, but to me, and I know, you know, it can get pretty, pretty granular with some of this, but I think there is a, at least sometimes in life, it's good to think about those and what our responsibility is and what our values are and, you know, those kinds of things. So as much as it can be challenging, I think it's actually a pretty, pretty healthy in, inquiry. And it's funny because if you do these things, if you spend time with plants and animals, it becomes very difficult to eat something without thinking about where it came from and what its impact might have been. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me ask you this. What, so we've, we've talked about a lot. Um, what haven't we talked about? Either that's in the book or related to the book. Well, oh, really. you don't want to ask me that because I could just <laughs> go on and on and on. And so I want to, I want you to ask your questions because actually one of the okay. best things about talking to other people and going on somebody else's podcast is that it's framed by your interests and you yeah. see it differently from the way I see it. So I'm way more interested in answering your questions than pontificating about the things <laughs> in the book that I think everybody should, should read. Okay. I appreciate that. Well, then with that, I'm going to go ahead and transition us to the enlightening lightning round. Okay. So this is a series of questions on a variety of topics, somewhat random. Um, okay. It's about nine questions. My aim for the most part is to ask the question and stand aside. I might tug on an answer here or there, but I'll work to keep us moving. Okay. First question, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a box of chocolate. Oh no, wait, I can't. Say that. <laughs> um, I don't know anything that life is like because it's so different from everything else. And you know, we started this conversation off by talking about what life is, and I think life is as I said, the thing that you make it. Um, And it's really the only thing we have that's like that. Yeah. It reminds me, I forget who the comedian was, but he talked about if we had a life-size map. (laughs) 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 It's really funny. Okay. (gasps) Then the second question is, what is something about which you have changed your mind in recent years? Oh, I've changed my mind about a lot of things. In fact, I, I give a whole talk about changing your mind because I think that mind changing instead of being, you know, leading to accusations of flip-flopping and inconsistency, I think that mind changing is the metric of, you know, reconsidering your own attitudes and, and really approaching things openly. And it's very hard for humans to do. We are, we are wired to make decisions with our gut and our guts don't change very much. But over the years, I have changed my mind First of all, basically about about the link between diet and nutrition. Way back in the 90s, um, I wrote a book about low fat eating. And then I have since decided that that is not the way to eat. It's a way to eat and it can work for some people, but it is not superior to other ways. And I have a completely different take 
on nutrition. Now, I have changed my mind about wonky stuff, like whether I think the FDA should oversee dietary supplements. And I used to think that they should have a much tighter rein on those things. And, uh, and now I don't think that that's the best use of limited resources because the harms are mostly to the pocketbooks of affluent people. And I would rather have the FDA protecting the least among us. Um, I have changed my mind about uh, programs that double SNAP coupons for the poor because I was thinking of it as a as a health um, intervention, and I was looking for data that showed that it worked. And then I went out with some people who did it, and it obviously is good for the people who par participated. And screw those metrics. I think this is a wonderful thing. Um, and I have other lists of things. I I go out in the world actively trying to find occasions to change my mind. And even when you do that, it's hard. And I have given talks in front of hundreds or occasionally thousands of people. And I will ask them, when was the last time you changed your mind? Think about the last year, had an issue of substance, you know, not, you know, chicken or fish. Um, there's something you took a stand on, you talked to your family about, raise your hand if you can tell me an issue in the last year that you changed your mind about. And in a room of hundreds or possibly thousands of people, I will get this smattering of hands, only a few. And there is no epidemic of mind changing going on, yet we all go out in the world anticipating that we can change other people's minds. Wow. Wow, that's uh, that is by far the most thoughtful response I've had to that question. <laughs> you know, hearing you share uh, makes me think of something I once read that Gandhi said. I don't know that he really said it, but he said, "My my commitment is to truth, not to consistency." That's thought, a, that's a pretty good answer or a pretty yeah. good way of living. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then Alan Watts. When Alan Watts said, "You are under no obligation to be the same person you were five minutes ago." <laughs> <laughs> like, I love that. So thank you for that. Okay. Uh, question number three, if you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a phrase on it or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Be kind. Mm. I okay. think it's the single most important thing to be. Yeah. Question number four, what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often? Jonathan Haidt, The Righteous Mind. Uh, he wrote it in 2012, maybe. Um, and it is the basis for, uh, for how I think about how humans make decisions. And it has, it has been seminal in how I think about my work because I read that book. And before I read it, I thought of myself as a pretty good evidence-based decision maker. And after I read it, I realized that humans suck at making evidence-based decisions. And if I was going to try and be a decent decision maker, I was going to have to work really, really hard at it and to try and set my own biases aside. And I have come up with a list of strategies that I use to try and make sure that I don't go down my own rabbit hole. And I, I think that it sheds light on human decision-making in a way that can change the way we view ourselves. Wow. What, what's an example of one of those strategies you use? Um, so I, I'm a journalist, I, but I'm a, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a columnist, so I'm paid to have an opinion, basically. So I'm not like a beat reporter. And I've been writing about food for 20 plus years, so I have opinions about all of these things. And when I sit down to write a column. One of the first things I do is to try and find the smartest person who disagrees with me and listen. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, and so once I do that, then I try and build the best case I can for the position I don't hold, because if I'm wrong, I want to be able to talk myself out of it. And, uh, and it is the way I've changed my mind on a few things. And it's funny because I, my, my father, uh, who died about three years ago, my father was notorious for being willing to take any side of any issue 
just for the pleasure of hashing it out. He <laughs> loved thinking about these things and arguing about things and talking about things and, you know, politics and things with the stuff of dinner table conversations in my childhood. And as, and it was the most annoying thing because you, you, this is not an endearing human characteristic. And I, uh, and it used to bother me, but I, two things. Number one, I sort of internalized the idea that almost every issue has two or maybe more reasonable sides. Yeah. And, but second, there's nothing like the humiliation of losing an argument to somebody who doesn't even believe in the argument he's making. And it, and it makes you really think hard about how and why you believe the things you do. This sounds like a book that uh, that I'll definitely check out because I remember when the trolley problem was yeah, 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 and people couldn't tell you why. Well, I don't know. It just feels wrong or whatever. But we often, I'm convinced, don't even know what we truly believe or why we do what we do. So did did you by any chance read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow? I did. Okay. So that's, it's the same basic idea. So, you know, Kahneman has system one is your gut and system two is your head. Um, Height's metaphor is the elephant and the rider. So system one is the elephant and system two is the rider. And your elephant knows exactly what he thinks about every con controversial issue. And you would hope that your rider, system two, would be in a position to correct your elephant, but it turns out that your rider's job is just to justify the, the, the direction the, the elephant is taking. And confirmation bias just rules the human psyche. And I, I think that understanding those things has made me go out in the world a lot less certain about a lot more things. Yeah, no doubt. And the history of science, like the history of humanity, I, I believe is it is the history of being wrong. You know, it, it, it sure is. <laughs> and, I, I I mean, just learned, go, go ahead. ahead. Say what you were going to say. I was going to say that I, I was like, as an example, I just learned that until the 20s, we believed that the Milky Way galaxy was the edge of the universe. And, you know, now we believe something well, different. And I suspect we'll believe something different in another hundred years. Think about, you know, 200 or 300 years ago, we think, oh, those poor schlubs, they thought, you know, cholera came through the air and, you know, they did bloodletting for everything. And, uh, but 200 years from now, we are the schlubs, you know, yeah, what hill are you going to die on? <laughs> that's right. That could help with, uh, hopefully. History is a bitch. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Okay. Uh, question number five, this has to do with travel. I imagine you've traveled a lot in your career. Not that much, actually. You just got those two acres in Cape Cod. And you just I, 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 no, I, okay. Uh, let's go to the question and then maybe I'll put it in context. <laughs> okay. So this is when you do travel, however infrequent it might be, was something you do or something you take with you to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? I take lots of books on uh, audiobooks and I listen to them in the downtime on planes and things like that. Um, so audiobooks and comfortable shoes. I think those are the two things that grease the skids of travel. <laughs> yeah, that makes a big difference. Question number six, what's something you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? All my life I've been exercising. And it's uh, because I want to continue, I want my body to continue to function as I age. And it's been hard because I, I have a heart problem. I had to stop running and that was tough for me. Um, but uh, I, I think that you have to focus on the things as you age is the things that you can do and you can't be mourning the things that you can't do anymore because aging is inevitable and we all basically have to stop running at some point. Unfortunately, my point came earlier than I wanted. And uh, yeah, so I definitely try and take care of my body in the hopes that it will serve me well as I dodder into antiquity. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Question number seven, what's something you wish every American knew? That what you eat doesn't matter very much as long as it's a relatively whole food. Hmm. Okay. Question number eight, 
What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? Yeah, I think I'll go back to what I said before, which is that 80% is kindness and courtesy. And it's kindness and courtesy when it's hard, when you're angry, when you're tempted to say the thing that would hurt. And saying a thing that hurts can undo years of kindness and courtesy because you can't unsay it. Um, so it's really important to not say those things in the first place. And I think I try to never say anything mean ever. What, uh, what is some of the other 20%? Oh, I think a lot of it's luck. You know, <laughs> yeah, do the things too. that you you happen to do irritate your partner? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Kevin hates it when like things impinge on like hallways because it, it, he's bigger than I am and and he feels like he doesn't have enough space to maneuver. And I I I had to learn not to do that. But most of the things, our foibles, just don't drive each other nuts. And I do think that that's mostly a matter of luck. And if if you treat your spouse or your partner invariably with kindness and courtesy and respect, um, that's, that's most of the thing. But the thing is, if you choose a spouse you admire, that's easy to do. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I got really lucky. I, I have a spouse I admire who is kind and courteous and respectful. And we have a wonderful life together. That's beautiful. And not by accident. And again, I know there's been a lot of hard work and thoughtfulness. Okay, question number nine. Aside from compound interest, what is the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money? It's arithmetic. And people make it so complicated, but it's addition and subtraction. And we all learned it in second grade. Um, and in some ways, it's a lot like nutrition. Uh, there are a lot of people who are heavily invested in complicating it, um, but it's really very straightforward. And, you know, that's not investing. And, you know, full disclosure, my husband's a professional trader and he takes care of all of our money. <laughs> and all, all I have to do is just you know, use the card and it works. And I, it, it, it seems sort of silly to talk about this when I am fortunate enough to have enough financial resources to not worry about money. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't deign to give advice to people who are struggling, but it does come down to making sure if you can to only spend what comes in. Yeah. I know that sounds really stupid, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I think there is a deep wisdom there. And I'm reminded of a, a Saturday Night Live skit with Steve Martin where they were talking. I don't know that it was even how to be rich, but it was uh, spend less than you earn. And they're like, Wait I know, a minute, I know. You're saying we have to spend less than we earn. I know. That's it. <laughs> That's it. I know. I know. <laughs> it's so funny. And it, it does sound really stupid, but there are people out there who are trying to bamboozle people with, you know, crazy car loans and things like that. And, and those people really make me angry because you're just deliberately trying to trick somebody. Yeah. I'll stop now. Money's not my field. Yeah. Well, there are many forms of wealth. I know that's true. So, okay. Well, speaking of money, one of the things, and I do have a few more questions for okay. you about writing and creativity, but uh, before we go there, uh, one of the things that I have done in an effort to express my gratitude to you for sharing of your time and your wisdom with me and everyone listening is I have gone on the micro lending site, kiva.org. And I have made a hundred dollar micro loan to a woman named Enma in Honduras. She's 25 years old. She lives in a place called Yoro and she has a small food store and she will use this to buy um, supplies for her business and in that way, improve the quality of life I am for delighted by that. It is a yeah. wonderful thing. And I'm sure this is something that you do regularly with your guests. You find a way to, to, to pass on the gratitude to somebody who needs it. And I think that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. 
Thank, Thank you. you. And, and it's my, my pleasure. And part of what I love about this is that it's not um, charity. Mm-hmm. You know, it is a loan and there is interest and the entrepreneur does repay it. I don't see any of that. Instead, it goes to fund the operations of the field partner, the person who does administer it. But in that way, I hope that this does create more self-reliance and in a, even a virtual, a virtuous cycle, I hope. So, yeah. Okay. Well, with that, we're coming down the stretch. We're on the last part of the interview. And uh, as I mentioned, this has to do with writing and, and maybe creativity, maybe even marketing and promotions or telling the world about the work that we do. Um, let me start by asking you, when did you first know you were a writer? I'm not a writer the way, you know, you're like an extrovert or a Pisces, you know, uh, uh, for me, it is a job that I do that I think I'm better suited to do than most other jobs. And I didn't call myself a writer until I made my living writing because for me, it's a, it's a profession. It's not some inherent quality. Um, and it's, I think it's possible that I could have been something else. In fact, if I had to do it all over again, I think I'd like to be a cognitive neuroscientist, (laughs) but, but, but writing suits me. And I hope that on a good day, I have at least some talent for it. And, um, and it lets me express the things that I think are important and talk about the things that I'm thinking about. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to do it. Oh, who has been influential in your development um, as a writer and what have you learned from them? I think writers, most of us uh, do a lot of reading and one of the best things that happens when you read is that inevitably you read people who have way more talent than you. (laughs) And so, you know, I think I'm having a good day. I turn in a good column and then I'll go read, you know, Robert Graves (laughs) or something. And I'm like, yeah, I should be bagging groceries. (laughs) And, (laughs) and, um, and it, the thing that I learn is, is, what I, what I can do and what I can't do. And it has taught me to stay focused on the things that I'm good at. And as a writer, there are a few things that I think I probably am good at. I think I'm good at making science accessible. I think I can tell a funny story. Um, uh, but if you're looking for lyricism, man, you got to go elsewhere. And so reading other writers makes me really appreciate people who can do things I can't do and help me focus on doing the things I can do. What, um, what writerly, what habits and routines are part of your life that are related to writing? It totally varies. It completely depends on what, what I'm working on. And so like a while, quite a while ago, I wrote a couple of romance novels under a pseudonym and, and I had a habit. I would get up in the morning and I would, I'd have coffee and I would not move on to anything else until I had a thousand words done. And then I would put that away and I would move on to other things. And if I have projects like that, I will still have that kind of discipline. Like when I was working on the book, I was trying to write however many thousands of words a week. Um, You know, I knew I had a deadline at a certain day, you divide it by the number of weeks you got (laughs) and and you make sure that that you stay on track. Um, I know it's a very pedestrian thing, um, but that's, that's the kind of thing that where deadlines work for me. And, and it's so prosaic. Yeah. No, that's, that's one of the things that really fascinates me about writing is that in some ways there is the artistic and the creative and the muse, there's like all of this. And then this other side, that's very pragmatic. It's just, it's Always. almost like laying bricks and it's, you can calculate it and deadlines help. And whenever I think of that, I think of that Duke Ellington quote about, I don't need more time. I need a deadline. <laughs> Right. And that's exactly it. You know, muse schmooze. I got a deadline. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I learned to write on deadline. I, uh, that was always what it was about. And, and, you know, I, I hope that I'm a 
good craftsman. Um, but yeah, I, I write to order and I write on deadline. In your view, what are the qualities of a good, what are the qualities of a great sentence and how can we write more of them? It totally depends because a great sentence for me is going to be different from a great sentence from somebody who's actually good at lyricism. And, um, and, but I think that the thing that I'm in tune to when I'm writing is rhythm and I, uh, and to my ear looks for a certain kind of rhythm to a paragraph and how sentences fit together. And, um, and that, that's really important to me. And, and I appreciate it in other people's work. And I find that it's sort of a foundation of, of, of my work. Mm. Tell me about, I realize as a columnist that you'll have an editor or other people mm -hmm. in the process, at least to some degree. And sometimes one of the roles those other people have is to give the piece a title, but I also know that can be collaborative or you can offer a title. Yes. What's your approach? Like, what are your thoughts and what's your approach to like titles? So it, it's different from what it used to be because the, the main purpose of titles now in journalism is to make sure that you you're optimized for the search engines. And so titles are different from what they used to be. And I don't have a lot of expertise in that particular field. And so I tend to, to leave it to other people. And, you know, some of us dinosaur journalists are like, yeah, remember the day when we could put puns in titles and, <laughs> and, and you can't really do much of that anymore, but um, it's a different skill now. It's not really a writing skill. It is a writing skill, but it's also um, a, a, somebody who really understands the ways of the internet in ways that, that I don't. So. Yeah. Well, and right in what you're saying here, I remember the first time I heard someone who's a successful blogger talk about, he would go look at what the Google search terms were and then go write an article based on that search. Term. I was like, that seems so yep. awkward. I get it. And people, yes. And I, I understand it too. And, and, you know, when I was blogging, that's exactly what people were doing. And, and I balked at it, which was one reason I kind of sucked at it. And I am grateful now to have the platform, the Washington Post, and being able to write what I want to say and have other people worry about getting the headline in. Mm. Tell me about your relationship with your reader in the act of writing. Like how present do they seem? Very how present. present totally very present. I'm always cognizant that I am writing for someone. And I think that that is a writer's obligation. I I, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that I think I could write about, but I, I feel an obligation to my reader to engage their interest, to be entertaining. And that doesn't mean, you know, soft shoe, ha ha. It can be just interesting in some way. I very strongly feel that I write for someone. And if I don't engage their interest, I'm not doing my job. Mm -hmm. You have in mind a composite kind of reader. Or do you choose specific people sometimes? Like what? Nope. Because I I hear from readers and I know that they run the gamut, and yeah. so I I just I I'm pretty ecumenical when it comes to you know who do I want to appeal to. Um, I want to appeal to anyone who's interested in the thing that I'm writing about. I don't want to put people off um, by you know, being esoteric. I don't want to talk down to people who know a lot about these things. I want to have a bona fide, organic feeling conversation, which is weird because, of course, I'm only responsible for one side of it. But, but yeah, no, I don't have anybody specific. I, I, I want people to enjoy what I write. Mm -hmm. what, um, what do you think is the best money you've ever spent as a writer? I don't know that I've spent a lot of money as a writer. I mean, the whole point of being a writer is to make money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of people will answer that, by the way. A lot of people just say, oh, all the books I bought. 
that informed my writing. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. But yeah, I would have bought those anyway. So yeah. I I don't know if I can say that. No, no, I I don't. And you know, I've never. Sorry, I'm sorry. I just over you. No, 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 no. Now we're. I, I was just going to share too that there's a surprising, to me, surprising number of people who will say, "Oh, it was this one workshop. I went to this one book proposal workshop or something." Oh, and I get that. And I, I know people who have really benefited from, from those kinds of things. Um, and I definitely benefit from having writer friends and we send things back and forth and talk about each other's work, but I've never done anything like that. I no journalism school, no nothing. I just, I, I read a lot and I try and write to the best of my capability. It seems to be working out. Well, cool. Um, my last, I think my last question here is, um, is just what advice or encouragement would you leave anyone listening with who is either in the middle of their own creative project, they're struggling, or it's a dream they've harbored for a long time, but for whatever reason they haven't begun. What do you say to those people to help them get their own books done and out into the world? If you're, if you want to be a writer, um, and you're new at it, my all purpose piece of advice is to write about something you're not personally invested in. Because if you're new at this, it's really hard to separate. If you're writing about something that's close to you and everybody says, write what you know, and you should write what you know, but it's difficult to write about things that you have strong emotions about because it's hard to figure out whether those things are compelling because they're yours um, or is there some universal that you can tap into that would be compelling to other people? And I think the way to learn to write, and it's not the only way, but I think one way to learn to write is to write about things that aren't so close to you, because then you can focus more easily on the craft of, of writing. And, you know, I learned to write by cranking out stuff for women's magazines and, you know, making it fit whatever they needed um, and being edited by people who had different ideas and having to have different tones and different voices. And it, 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 it exercises the muscle. And, uh, and in the end, I think um, it made me a better writer. Oh. Oh. Well, Tamar, I have really enjoyed this conversation. I love your book. I'm really grateful that we had the chance to talk and I'm grateful for you spending so much time talking with me today. Brilliant. You're a pleasure to talk with and you've asked me questions that nobody has ever asked me and, <laughs> and I appreciate that very much. So thank you so much. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or they live in conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated, or you've gone through a divorce, or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine-month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential. It can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, it's designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.